My name is Councillor Ige. Um, I am going to start with apologies of absence. So I do have apologies for, for lateness for Izzy, and I do have apologies from Councillor Lade as well. Thank you so much, Pat, for joining us. Is there any urgent business that anybody would like to declare? I can see none. Um, could we take it in any other business, if that's okay? Thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any declarations of interest to declare? I see that as a no. Okay. Um, just bear with me one moment. Um, okay, so I think we're going to go on to the meeting now, which is the annual meeting with registered providers of social housing. Um, and we have Wells, who is the Managing Director of South London Peabody. So welcome, and thank you so much for coming today. Uh, thank you. You're going to be doing a presentation, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, I did send over a few slides, although it turns out the file was a bit too big, so I had to PDF it, but looks like you guys have figured out how to set it up, so that's a good thing. Um, okay, so you can do your presentation and then afterwards we'll take some questions if that's okay with you. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Oh, welcome, Councillor Pat Sattery. Thank you, good evening. Um, we do have an agenda. Would you like me to pass it over to you? Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for inviting us again uh, to uh, this year's um, uh, scrutiny panel. Uh, my name is Wells Chomutare. I am the managing director for our South London operation at Peabody. So just a bit of uh, overview in Peabody. Uh, we've organized um, uh, our operations into regions. As we've grown bigger, we recognize the importance of staying local. So in recognition of that, we have organized ourselves into regions in total, uh, following our recent major with cut list um, a, few, a couple of years ago, we now have uh, our geographical footprint spans um, is much more wider, uh, all the way from Cambridge to uh, uh, Kent. Um, in, in Greater London, we have three regions, uh, which north of the river is northeast, northwest, south of the river, it's South London, uh, for which I'm responsible for and Greenwich uh, sits in the south, in the south region. So, move on. so just, so people in Greenwich, um, just a few numbers here. I, I'm not gonna go through every, everything, uh, but as you can see, um, you know, we, we, we have, you know, our presence in actual fact, uh, within, this, within South London, uh, Greenwich um, is, is the biggest borough by number um, within, the, uh, uh, within South London. Um, breakdown of our social homes there, as you can see, mostly um, in terms of tenure time, most, most of our homes, as you would expect uh, for an organization like people with the history, uh, is mainly social rents. Um, if you look down uh, on, on the bottom left, you're also going to get a sense of the um, size of the homes that we have. Um, and it's a good thing that we have, you know, kind of reasonably sized properties there with two beds and three beds as well. Uh, of course, we could do more with four beds, but uh, usually the, the split is usually evenly a third, a third, but as you can see, two beds and, and three beds are uh, got the highest number there. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the process is, but if at any point you have any questions, do feel free to ask me um, 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 as I go through. Uh, Chair, <laughs> what questions we go through? Just in terms of your uh, total um, stock in, in the borough, 
there are, what, 11 or 1,200 homes within Charlton Triangle. And would the, or, there are a few that are, like I remember a few in Bloomfield Road, when I represented Woolwich Common, that are uh, Peabody. And <coughs> presumably there are a few isolated ones, but the, the bulk, presumably, will be, apart from Charter Triangle, will be in Thamesmead, is that right? Absolutely, the, the majority of our homes are definitely in Thamesmead. Um, I would say probably uh, around about maybe uh, 75 of our presence, 75%, so, so you're quite right. But as you pointed out, um, Charlton Triangle are part of the Peabody Group, so that just ups our numbers as well, but this doesn't, doesn't account for that. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I'll let you go after me, Pat, if that's okay. Um, how many properties do you have that are vacant at the moment? Yeah, so I've got a slide in there, which okay. we'll talk about. I've it. dropped and the gun. Okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, so fine. It's, um, it's in there. Would uh, you like to proceed, Councillor Pat? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I have one or two residents in my ward who are wanting to, to move to a different authority. How easy is that with Peabody? To a different authority within the Peabody? Within stock? the Peabody, yes. Okay. Within so, Peabody, yes. Yeah. So we, like most providers and local authorities, we are in the process of uh, carrying out a review of our rehousing policy, but as it stands, uh, we have a waiting list, which is quite unmanageable, if I'm going to be frankly honest. Um, yes, you can move uh, based on, the, obviously, um, your priorities. So say, for example, you want to move because it's a priority move to a certain area, then yes, you can. However, just to give you um, an appreciation of the churn a year, we probably move through internal transfer about 300, 100 people. Um, and we are an organization uh, now the size of 107,000 homes. So yes, the provisions in the current policies are there, but it's, it's, it's very, very difficult because we almost have to prioritize, if you like, those highly urgent and uh, more priority cases. But if it's just a basic uh, need to move to a different area, yes, the opportunities are there, but it's, it's that availability of homes um, that probably uh, we struggle with in terms of demand. Okay. Just a quick one. It's all right. Uh, you gave us the breakdown of the types of homes, social, affordable, and so on. <coughs> how do you decide what they're going to be, um, and how, how did you decide the numbers for, say, key workers? Um, um, as you'll appreciate, you know, Peabody is very, um, are one of the oldest housing associations, so those numbers represent years and years of planning uh, requirements. Uh, a lot of what we build is determined by the planning requirements at the time, so that's a culmination of all those years of planning. This is where we are now. So if we, in, in terms of it, obviously you're aware of our plans to build homes, um, more new homes that are desperately needed. You know, the allocation and the sizes, it's all kind of influenced by the local authority in terms of where the need are because it has to go through planning. So in, in part, as a register provided, you know, the local authority is a, is a key part in doing that, um, particularly through planning because we don't do that a lot. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I suppose we're, we're making it a given that we've read the report, we received the report today. Is, is that right? So I can bring up an issue that's um, from anywhere in the report. Is that right? Okay, fine. Well, I'll, I'll leave it to that. Um, and just to add, obviously, we've tried to, you gave us a brief, which we have tried to capture in there. We have added additional information, but my focus will be uh, on the areas that you've asked us to provide. So, I mean, this slide that I have, just additional context, so you also get a sense. So you will have some additional, but you will see everything that you've asked for in terms of uh, uh, this meeting. Uh, just briefly on the, here, just you get a sense of our rents on average, uh, like um, as a benchmark, you know, two bed in Greenwich at Peabody Home is on average 117. So you get a sense of, you know, how we compare towards what we could call target rent. And we've put some numbers there that just give you a sense of when we, we scale up in, in, in Greenwich, you know, what does that mean in terms of subsidy? 
just because we're below target rent, that will amount to three million in terms of um, you know, the, the subsidy that we, uh, we provide. Um, and if you look at our market rent within the borough, that even goes up to 44, 44 million. So that gives you a sense of, yes, the market rent, yes, the social rents, but they're probably relatively far much lower uh, than, um, than other providers in the borough. Uh, repairs, so this is another area that um, you wanted to get a sense of uh, how we're doing. So we just kind of give you an overview, and, and I won't necessarily go through, through everything, but um, the information is available. So um, in, in Greenwich, this financial year so far, we've raised um, 8,200 repairs, around about that. Um, and obviously, they, there's, there's always a seasonal uh, increase around winter. Um, and, and usually, the, um, the, you know, our top repairs, the most repairs that we're dealing with the plumbing, uh, carpentry, and uh, electrical related jobs. Um, some, some key insight in, t in terms of within that data, um, you, know, you know, those uh, 8,000 repairs were quite unique to about 2,700 properties. 32% um, of those were only required one repair. Uh, about 68% of those required a follow-up uh, from us uh, as well. Um, and uh, as we speak right now, we have about 1,200 uh, repairs in our work in progress, which we call our WIP. Um, and on average, it takes about 18 days to uh, complete a repair. So, so in Peabody, we track satisfaction in two ways. Obviously, there's uh, TSMs that are coming in, and we've been measuring ourselves um, in, in, in readiness of, of the new regulation, but also we do carry out uh, transactional surveys. So when a, when a repair is completed, um, you know, you get your usual text, are you satisfied, um, um, or are you happy? And, and this is what uh, this satisfaction represents. So give you a sense of um, the satisfaction levels uh, when, when we complete a, re a repair. If we, if we just suppose or we compare that to uh, Lucium, you can see, um, you know, given the geographical concentration that we have usually in places like Thamesmade, it also kind of gives us that ability to be able to do more in one geographical area, and that's represented in, in a relatively higher um, satisfaction compared to Lewisham. If when repairs are carried out, if they're quite a major, does someone actually go, you know, at the, well, obviously, you will ask if they're satisfied with the repair, the tenant. But does someone go out to actually check that those repairs, someone from Peabody, to check that they have been done to satisfaction? Yeah, so what we do at the current moment within our approach, we will sample check the quality of repairs. Um, yes, obviously, we rely on those satisfaction surveys or our residents telling us um, if there's any issues. But I think as part of the contract is that we have with our suppliers, we will, we will post-check a percentage, but um, it's nowhere near every repair. Oh, oh yeah, so, so there will be particularly those, if you like, big repairs. Uh, usually, depending on the nature of the repair, if it's a, a very big repair, our surveyors will usually be involved anyway, because they're the ones that go in the homes, they're the ones that scope out the works, and it usually, if it's a type of repair that requires uh, the household to be moved out of the property, we will certainly not move them back in until we're satisfied that the property is in a good condition. Um, yeah, this is something that's sort of um, quite involved, I'm quite involved with at the moment. You're talking about if repairs are large repairs, that you may have to move the the residents out of the property and to decant them to another property. Um, do you have properties available where you can send those people, or and, and you know how close or, or how far? Well, some of them I don't know. If, if families have children and the schooling is near, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, do you have a number of properties that you keep specifically? for people who have to be, as you might say, don't like the word, decanted yeah. out of their property yeah. for a certain time. Yeah, so, so uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate that it's very difficult to keep, at the moment, uh, a number of stock um, available in Greenwich for, uh, for different scenarios, because obviously 
we have different sized properties. So essentially you would probably require, given the amount of situation around repairs that we may experience, um, that's not an, um, an approach that we have taken, or, but that's something that we're looking to consider. I think generally most providers, uh, when they need to move someone away for uh, uh, an important repair that cannot be carried out with someone in situ, we, we rely on our suppliers that um, provide us with temporary accommodation. Now, usually, if it's a short period of time, I would say a week or two, uh, depending on the circumstances of the household, we, ha we, we have various options. So it could be hotel, uh, it could be service apartments. So we have to make sure, and these service apartments, where we can, we try and source them um, to make sure we don't disrupt, um, if you um, disrupt the family, the day-to-day. Uh, but certainly we, what we, we don't have is properties waiting and sitting, uh, given the demand of properties uh, in London. So I think what we're trying to do, and this is more around um, you know, in a bit of more innovation and developing our approach, is where, where we know that uh, we need to move a family and it perhaps it, 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 there's an opportunity for them to be rehoused and it's, it's practical, we will utilize those opportunities, but it isn't always the case. And sometimes, if the, even if the opportunity is there, some families, because they've set roots in particular areas, they would almost prefer to move out. But we will look for suitable um, accommodation. So if you look at uh, most of the service apartments that we can secure. So it's, not, it's, it's a home, but it, uh, so effectively what, we, what it allows is it's got all the bedding, the white goods, um, and so if we're having to move a family out, all we do is we either put their items in storage and then they get to move maybe with their clothes. And then so they, it's almost a home. It's almost a, um, a rented house, but it's furnished rather than placing uh, in family in hotels. Although we do, uh, because obviously you, you've, you've got some who would prefer and depend, depending on the duration. Uh, can I thank you, Wells, um, for the, uh, providing this data, which is, is very useful and very interesting, and, and at the time of 18, average time of 18 days seems good, uh, as well as satisfaction ratings seem good, but be good if they were better than Bexley. Um, I just wondered, obviously, we've had uh, challenges in terms of our repair service, uh, which you may or may not have been following, um, and we're on a transformation program, and I just wondered... Uh, what the customer experience is, uh, whether they have the tenant experience, whether they will have an acknowledgement, uh, whether they have a text telling them what time someone is coming and so forth, and then a text afterwards asking them what they thought of the service. Uh, how sophisticated is your customer management system uh, in, in the way that you track and manage those repairs? Okay, so I'll answer it in two ways. So. Currently, as we're speaking, people is going through, a, we're re-procuring our repair service. Um, how are we doing that? We are, we, we say for example, in, in South London, obviously we've given our contractors uh, specific requirements around customer experience, making sure that through the customer journey, uh, the customer is, um, is updated, where you rate repair, the choice of making an appointment, uh, having that uh, information that tells you when you're your operatives making their way. So those are, if you like, further improvements that we've incorporated into the procurement. The other thing that we've done is, uh, in South London, we've divided the area because if you look, um, my, my area covers South. But could you answer my question about the, from a customer point of view? Yeah, so from how, a customer. How, how you track the actual repairs? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, so, so we now have my Peabody, and so if you, if you raise a repair with us, so you could raise a repair, either we have um, my Peabody, what we call is our self-serve, you could raise that, it takes media, so you're able to see your, your, your repair and you're able to choose an appointment or through our call center. There is more to do on that front in terms of, um, you know, checking on the progress. But when the operative is coming out, they will either call you uh, to tell you that they're coming for the appointment. What we don't have at the moment fully embedded in our systems is that technology that I'm telling you about where you are able to track. So they're coming tomorrow in the morning, they, they give you a notification. The contractors that we're procure, procuring right now, we're looking to mobilize them in August. So the customer journey is, 
is, is as good as it can be, uh, but we certainly think there's more that we can do on the customer journey front. And if I, I might just ask why you've decided to go to, to, go to privatise a service? I mean, L&Q do a very good in-house service. The council have their service in-house. Many, many housing providers do have in-house services. Obviously not for specialist things that require specialist skills, but for the basic sort of plumbing, electrics, you know, carpentry and, and so forth that you'd get. Uh, you know, many providers will find it's much more effective and you get the pride and um, commitment if it's done in-house. And, and you're very right about that. So in terms of our supply chain, we have what we call a mixed economy. So we have two DLOs in Peabody uh, that cover particular regions. As you will appreciate with repairs, there's a big risk if you have one provider. Um, so what we have is a, a mixed supply of, um, of contractors. So two DLOs, we in, and then we'll have what we call first tier contractors. So those will be the main contractors, but also what we will have is the new arrangement will be based on performance. So if, we, if you are the preferred uh, provider in that area and you're not performing well, our provisions in the contract allow us to have secondary co uh, contractors or neighboring uh, contractors. So, so the description I was, of the explanation I was giving you earlier is a very important one. So if you look at South, South, uh, South London, whereas you will probably have one contractor, say an excess, I'm just putting it out there, we've split our South London into three lots. So essentially what it means is um, the Greenwich side and the Lewisham side will have different contractor providers. So it's three areas. So if we're finding that maybe uh, the adjacent provider is struggling, we can, we can turn the tap and move it to the neighboring contractor who's performing well. So that's over years of experience of having dealing with contractors. Our in-house DLO almost um, serves as a, a, a first tier contractor in certain regions. Uh, so there will be two that they cover, one in Northwest, one in Northeast. But our, our in-house, our void service at the moment is carried out by our DLO. So these are people who are uh, um, um, employed uh, service. Okay. Yeah, I do, I do have a load of slides, so I'm not, sure if, I'm not sure if there's only one waiting, but, uh, but I'm happy. Every chance. Okay, so we move on. So uh, another slide there just to give you a sense of um, the volumes that we are grappling with around damper mode. It's a very important issue that uh, Ad Peabody, or we obviously are focusing to address. Um, it just gives you a sense of the volumes in the last 12 months. We do have a dedicated process um, around damper mode that we introduced um, a few years ago, which is working very well. Um, again, with, within the systems that we have, what we're doing is we're also trying to have a proactive approach. So we already know certain properties that are prone to damper mold. So our approach is not to wait for concerns to be raised, but for us to be more proactive um, when we carry out any works related to damper mold. Um, we do have, uh, after 12 months, we check in to make sure everything's okay. The idea is to make sure that when we resolve issues, uh, they're permanent. But as you will know, with, sometimes with damper mold, it comes up, but checking in just gives us that opportunity to see which uh, measures are effective um, or, or whether we need to try uh, different things. And again, a sense of the average delivery times, as you would expect uh, with damper mode, uh, it would be much, uh, um, much more big, uh, larger than the, than the responsive repairs. Um, also want to give you a sense around complaints um, um, in terms of uh, uh, this, you know, in terms of our overall complaints uh, related to, uh, to, to repairs, so you can see uh, just the volumes that we have. Um, and also in Greenwich, we do have one case uh, awaiting determination with the Ombudsman. But 64% of our cases are closed within 25 working days. 46% uh, of stage two case, uh, cases uh, within four, four, 40 working days. Usually when it gets to stage two, it requires a lot of intensive work with our residents. So therefore, naturally, it, it takes longer. These are the scenarios perhaps where we may need to rehouse uh, our residents temporarily to get the issues permanently fixed where we can. Um, this is another area which um, you wanted to know a bit more about. And I think, uh, Councillor um, uh, Eager, you, you were keen to 
to get this information. So, so just, just jumping straight, um, so on average, uh, a general needs home uh, takes us about uh, 38 days uh, to relet. Um, obviously, our aim is always to try and lower that number to, to reduce the number of days a home is empty because we know there's a need for it, but also equally it costs money when a property is sitting empty. But again, we want to make sure when we carry out the necessary works, it's done um, so that it's, 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 it's in good condition, ready for any families that are moving in. So in the last 12 months in Greenwich, we have relet a total of 70 homes, um, and most of these are general needs. Um, we, we do have uh, a portfolio of market, uh, intermediate market rent levels um, as well. Um, 42 of these relets were allocated to Greenwich, so we have a nominations agreement with you guys. 75% um, of all our voids, whether what we call true or non-true voids, um, uh, uh, to be, uh, they go to, to Greenwich for, your, for, for the social waiting list. So, um, and, I'm, and that's reconciled, and um, you guys track that to make sure we're, we're keeping up um, we're, we're, with the quotas that we're supposed to. Um, there were also uh, two new homes in there as well uh, that we relet, uh, uh, which is effectively the second let of a new home. Um, in terms of shared ownership, so over the last two financial years, um, you know, uh, 22, 23, we had uh, 16 shared ownership homes uh, in the borough, so that's uh, Greenwich Wharf and, and Greenwich P uh, Police Station. Um, there's a number there that's missing uh, as well, uh, which is temp covers Thamesmead, Southmere, where we had 109 uh, shared ownership homes as well that came in over the last two financial years. Um, we've got 296 uh, homes uh, to be delivered um, at Plumstead, West Thamesmead, uh, in 25-28 as well. Um, so just give you a sense of the numbers in the pipeline uh, on the shared, shared ownership front. In terms of, uh, so this is a snapshot as of, when did we do this? Uh, Monday, <laughs> uh, we had 22 empty homes uh, currently in Greenwich. So these are homes that are going through what we call void works. Um, and, and, 21 of the, um, and 21 of these are general needs. Uh, seven of these are classed as being uh, empty long term, but these are what we call major works. So probably, um, during the void period, we need to change the kitchen or install a bath, so usually t it takes a bit longer. Um, I would say uh, routine voids turn around on average where we can. It's about 10 to 15 days. Um, anything over 20 days, we will class it as a major, as major works, uh, but that can vary. It could be uh, a number of things that need a bit more time. Um, think. That's, that's on there. So how do we manage antisocial behavior and hate crime? Um, so the first thing I wanted to point out that, um, you know, we work very closely with, with Greenwich and all the partners uh, within Greenwich. Um, as you will be aware, we are one of the signatory of um, your, your no, no, no Home for Harm pledge that was launched two years ago. So um, uh, amongst other, so essentially, which is a pledge that uh, encouraging all, encourages all the, the, the providers in Greenwich to take a collaborative approach when, when tackling antisocial behavior, um, so we signed up to that. Um, we are committed to making sure our neighbors are safe um, and welcoming for, for residents, and as I said, you know, we work in partnership with Greenwich and many other uh, partners in, um, in the area. We are also uh, uh, DAHA accredited um, and we are also co-founders of the airlines. So, um, you know, Gen2 Peabody and Standing Together were the original co-founders of, of DAHA um, when it was founded. Obviously, that's gone on to be a very important uh, player um, as well, organization advocating for effective management of uh, domestic abuse uh, um, for, for, for residents that live in social housing, whether it be th uh, uh, through housing associations or the local authority. Um, over the last months, um, what this information will tell you, obviously some of the high level cases that you may be aware that we were dealing with over the last year and, and we continue to deal with as, as community safety re remains an area of focus, but we do experience some challenges. But to give you a sense of the numbers 
of the reported cases over the last 12 months, uh, we opened 62 uh, community safety cases and 22 um, domestic abuse cases. Um, the thing to point out here is, you know, we always have a sense that there's always under-reporting when it comes to community safety. So even though we're giving you these numbers, they, they're not an indication of whether um, everything is being captured. And, and how do we respond to that? It's working through partners, um, you know, just getting feedback from residents and also encouraging them. So just because it hasn't been recorded doesn't mean we don't capture the feedback. Generally, what we encourage, uh, what we want to do, every contact that we make with our residents, we want to record it. So if you tell me there's an issue, I would almost encourage you, look, let, we're going to register this, this case um, as a contact and, and we will manage it as an antisocial behavior case, depending on the nature of what it is. But it's fair to say um, that not all, not all uh, community safety issues will be reported through our systems, as you would expect. Um, hate crime, the, the one thing that I will pull out from this is that when it comes to hate crime and domestic abuse, we take a victim-centered approach. So if you're a victim of domestic abuse or hate crime, um, when you report to us, we will take a victim-centered approach. What does that mean? It means because you're the victim, it, you don't have to prove to us you've been a victim. We take that approach that, because for you to be able to deal with, with this type of community safety issue, you almost have to have the trust, uh, you know, with the residents. So, you know, we won't say, we won't place the burden of proof on, on the complainant. You know, we understand how difficult it is for someone to come and tell us that they're a victim of a domestic abuse or hate crime. So rather than actually discourage people from, from reporting uh, um, such community safety issues, you know, by being discouraged because then when you come in, we say, okay, prove it. Um, it can always, uh, a very um, counterproductive way to manage cases, and that's, uh, that's our approach when it comes to hate crime. So what are we doing around, um, you know, sustainability, zero carbon and retrofit? Um, just recently, we, 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 we participated in uh, the Greenwich uh, RP partnership meeting uh, where we talked about our sustainability plans. Um, obviously, we, we had specialists in people with, like most organizations, we have a director of sustainability who, um, and, a, and, and a developer strategy that helps us to, up, to chart our way to, towards the ambitions that we have, um, you know, to be net zero uh, by, uh, you know, um, in Peabody. So here, just a sense of where we are. Over three quarters of Peabody homes already meet EPC standard C. Um, and of course, we, we recognize the importance of continuing to invest in our homes to make sure that they're even more sustainable. Um, we're investing over 50 million um, in, in our homes to make them more uh, uh, energy efficient. Um, we're matching, we, we recently secured 25 million uh, from the decarbonization fund and we matched that. So together we, we're retrofitting over 6,500 homes across Peabody. This is uh, just not uh, Greenwich. Um, anything that has uh, an APC rating of D or less, uh, those 6,500 homes is what we will be working on. So what does our engagement look like? Um, I think we're pretty active when it comes to engagement uh, with ward councillors. Now, it's fair to say that a lot of that engagement is really focused in terms made. Um, however, we do have um, a very good uh, a protocol for, for, um, for elected members. So we have a process where elected members, if you raise an inquiry, um, it, we've got a, um, a well-developed system that will make sure we track and then your, your inquiries are responded to. Um, some, some, some of the councillors uh, will, email, will email me directly or uh, we meet at different meetings. We will always make every effort to take any cases that our elected members have. I do recognise that if there's any areas where you feel there are gaps, um, I'm your main point of contact uh, for the South region. So if there's anything after this where you feel perhaps 
we could develop a, a better working relationship. Um, I'm open to coming out to going to sites of visits uh, if there are any areas that you feel uh, need our attentions so we can understand the issues and then work together to try and resolve that. Um, so the, the system that we have for uh, elected members, councillors and MPs, when you send an inquiry, you'll get an acknowledgement and we will let you know when we'll respond to those inquiries. Um, uh, works very well. So at the moment, in terms of if you have raised an inquiry, uh, we will record it and we'll track it to make sure uh, it's managed and in a timely manner. At the moment, as we speak, we have um, eight opening uh, queries from MPs or councillors. Over the last 12 months, we've received uh, 77 queries from councillors and MPs uh, across Greenwich. Common themes, damp and mold, leaks, rehousing. Uh, we always do get a lot of um, advocacy around rehousing, although that remains very challenging because of the lack of supply and, of course, antisocial behaviour, uh, as well as heating and hot water issues. So just gives you a flavour of uh, the type of issues that members uh, in Greenwich are raising with us. Um, this is not an area that you had asked for, but I just put a few slides for your information that gives you a sense of where we are in Bill and City, so I'll quickly run through. Uh, as we speak, uh, we have 57 buildings that are awaiting uh, investigation in Greenwich. These are mostly focused in, in Thamesmead and, and Charlton. Um, all the buildings are, are scheduled for investigation uh, this year and next year. So essentially, we have to investigate first to uh, make sure that the building is safe. However, this excludes high priority buildings. I must add, these, um, you know, we started our building program about uh, two financial years ago. So we have been prioritizing uh, high-risk buildings. So any high-risk buildings that are in Greenwich that would have been investigated and are already on a program or already have been remediated. Uh, we have remediated um, a number of uh, buildings um, in Tensement as well. What we would normally do is we will write to residents to when we are starting the investigation so, so that residents, usually when we are doing an investigation, we have um, you know, contractors that are appointed snooping around the state. So we give them the heads up so that they know and we always update them about the findings um, or any concerns or any plans in terms of remediation. Again, uh, this is additional information for you. Um, you can look at that at your own leisure. Just give you a sense of uh, the development. I've included Charlton there because we've got our Black Accord um, uh, which I think is nearly finished, if not already. Um, some of the past developments there you have with the REACH um, in, in Greenwich, Greenwich Police Station, Section 106, um, and of course, West, West Plums, um, you know, Plumstead, West Thames made, which is under construction right now um, and will deliver more um, homes that are needed um, in Greenwich and in London. And of course, the big plans that we have uh, for the Thames made waterfront uh, we continue to work with all the interested partners to, um, to bring more homes um, in terms of that are badly needed, but it will bring such a massive investment in the area as well. Um, I think this is probably one of my last slides. We're very active in Greenwich when it comes to uh, community development. Um, we, um, three areas, uh, the four areas that are highlighted there around e economic inclusion, uh, we are uh, an anchor organization in the area, so we're a key partner when it comes to community de development initiatives, and you can see the, the type of initiatives that we're involved in, quite very active around economic inclusion, children and families, as well, health and well-being, as well as supporting community activities. We do have a large number of community assets. Um, of course, the majority of those are also in Greenwich, but as, as a whole, Peabody across, uh, we, we despite the financial challenges that we're all facing, uh, it's one area that where our approach has obviously moved towards partnering just to make sure that that work uh, is not impacted. It is challenging, but it's an area that we continue to, to progress very well. So, whistle stop some. Um, Thank you very much for that, Will. That was very um, insightful and um, it, was, it gave me a lot of clarity because I did have some questions, but now I don't have any okay, questions. <laughs> um, I am going to start with this side first. Um, does anybody have any questions? Magella does. Um, and then David, and then I'll go back to Councillor Pat. Sure. I have one, 
Oh, you've had them answered as oh, well. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. My question is about illegal subletting, and I wonder how your system works. Is is it efficient in terms of do uh, tenants know who to contact to report a, a, um, a, a potential um, uh, subletting offence? What is your um, procedure to respond to that? And I, do you have much uh, incidence of it in Greenwich? And what would be your turnaround time to deal with it? Okay, so, so I'll, I'll respond generally first. So our approach to tenancy fraud in Peabody, um, we, we have a very strong approach to tenancy fraud in actual fact. We're one of uh, the housing pro providers that have had a, a specialist tenancy fraud team for a number of years. Um, and I think over the years, if you, if you look probably over a 10-year period, um, you know, the number of recoveries um, uh, that we have secured in Peabody uh, is, I think, um, is quite high in terms of recovery. So the last two years have been a bit of a blip. We've been getting about 70 properties recovered that are at risk of tenancy fraud. Tenancy fraud is a problem in the sector, uh, in social housing. Um, as you will appreciate, not only in Greenwich, um, our presence in some of the most prime areas means that us and other uh, providers, the shortage of housing means that the risk of tenancy fraud is very high. Um, I mean, I have states around that. So generally, when you, if you, if you suspect tenancy fraud, anyone that, um, the normal ways that you engage with us, so be it calling us, your local housing team, uh, you can let them know. Now, what I say with tenancy fraud is, where, once it's reported, because one of the things I mentioned is making sure that that contact is recorded. So we'd usually open a case, uh, and then if you're, if you're reporting, then we, we will keep you informed as, as the person that's reported a concern. Uh, tenancy fraud can take time to investigate, and obviously it has to be done in, in, in a very um, careful way. So I, I couldn't give you an average time how, um, how long it takes to manage a case, but we do have systems where if it's very basic tenancy fraud, the local housing teams will deal with it. So what advantage does a specialist team gives us? So we, we find that most um, um, instances of tenancy fraud are becoming more and more sophisticated. So we're moving away from, I haven't seen my neighbor for a while, this, it looks like a new family moved in. We look at our systems and we realize actually nobody's moved in. That's a very basic tenancy fraud. We will go in and we will knock on the door, carry out basic investigations. But we get into a position where um, people are not changing the details of you know, their um, credit footprint on the properties, but they still act as if they're present, but they will be sub subletting the properties. But there will be other cases where we don't have the benefit of neighbors telling us, but what we find is uh, their habits have changed, or somebody calls and makes a mistake and says, I need a repair. Our repair people go in, and then they find something's quite unusual. So we do have sophisticated resources that even allow us to see a level of detail that is, is not available to, to everyone, where we can tell you know, you know, whether you have assets somewhere else. Uh, what we're finding increasingly is um, in, in some of our serious uh, tenancy fraud uh, cases, because now it's a criminal offense, we are finding people with, with assets um, living in another, in another home in London, very high assets, and using social uh, properties to make money uh, through subletting. So we are very uh, serious about that, and we track our performance. Uh, we have a new pro, uh, we have a new, an approach uh, which we continue to evolve um, as tenancy fraud becomes complicated. Uh, thank you very much, um, Wells. Um, so I, I was going to ask a couple of questions. Um, firstly, uh, tenancy management. Um, obviously, you, you dealt, you focused, uh, as we asked, on the ASB element. That obviously com normally comes down to you know, high quality tenancy management. And I wondered what the ratio and retention rates are for your tenancy management, the ratio of tenancy managers to, um, or whatever you might call them, 
might not call them something else, but you know, you know what I mean, geographically based tenancy managers, what the ratio is, and uh, per um, home, and uh, what your retention rate is as well of, of tenancy managers. Um, I'm also very pleased to learn that uh, Valley House uh, is in my ward. Uh, we visited there recently, and there were some issues, but I'll talk offline about that, obviously, pick that up with you afterwards. Uh, but nice aside, but there were some snagging issues. Um, and um, I was going to ask, in terms of retrofit, um, which looks very, very good, I wondered if that, those percentages and the investment represented your whole stock across the southeast, uh, or is that those figures just for Greenwich? No, the, the figures are across all our stock. All oh, right. It might be yes. just, I don't know whether you can drill down at all uh, in terms of what, what's ha what the current position is on retrofit in the, your Greenwich stock and what investment there is in Greenwich. Um, won't be able to do that, but I can do that as a follow-up uh, query, if that's okay. I can get that data, data for you. Just going back on your uh, initial question. So last year, we, we, we invested a significant, uh, significant amount um, in our customer-facing teams. So previously, prior to our investment, um, I would say the average area of responsibility for a housing manager was in, in the region of 800. We have reduced that to 600. Um, the way we are setting up our, our, now that's to support the regional model that we're developing in Peabody, which we're calling local Peabody, because we, the areas of management for our teams, as well as, if you like, uh, breaking down people into regions means that we are more closer and more intimate to the areas that we manage. That gives us that local insight and intelligence. So, so to your point is, we have had new faces come in. Uh, we've invested also in an in-house uh, community safety team. You will find that in the sector sometimes there will be period where there will be different approach. We, we have reversed that approach. So we have a dedicated community safety team uh, that will deal with the egregious as, you know, community safety issues, more serious, that needs a certain level of expertise. Uh, so our neighbor manages um, about 600. Retention, I think there are two things in the sector which are changing, and I think those are the expectations around um, in the profession. I think those are going to pose a different challenge. You have two types of personnel that you normally find as housing managers. Those that are coming in into the sector, they're fairly new. Uh, they'll probably do a, a few years and move on. You have more established people uh, that will stay for longer periods of time. I think in terms of retention, um, South region, when I compare across Peabody, certainly fares better than other regions. So give you an example. When we um, <coughs> recruited more neighborhood managers last year, last year was we did a re reorganization and we recruited more staff. My region was the first one to get a full complement uh, of additional NMs that we recruited. We still struggle in Northwest and Northeast. You, I think in terms of um, retention, I would say, it, as I mentioned, it's probably in London reg regionally based. Some areas really str struggle with retaining uh, neighborhood managers, but generally it's a profession where those that enjoy the job, because you know, generally enjoy the job, will stay and then will continue to do the job they have. But that I think that's going to change, um, largely just because what the sector has gone through with building safety, uh, the cost of living crisis coming out of lockdown. Um, there's been a lot of um, you know undeclared crisis that we're dealing with. So and uh, the cut in in, in the social services, we are almost, the expectation on the housing manager today is, is certainly different to what it was uh, 10, 15, or 20 years ago. So that is, poses a challenge for recruiting, as certainly I think uh, it's gonna be challenging, challenging in, in, the, in the years to come. Is it? <laughs> Um, hi, thanks, uh, Wells, for coming. Um, yeah, it was really helpful to hear about some of the kind of development projects um, that you, you're looking to, particularly the Thamesmead waterfront. Um, but I've, we kind of get some feedback sometimes about, and it's a perception that people is kind of land banking. Um, and I guess how do you kind of challenge that and kind of feed back into the community that you are looking to develop a lot of the land around? 
um, around particularly, I guess, Thamesmead, Plumstead area to make sure that... I think the answer to that is, is in Thamesmead. I mean, you, you see the commitment that we're making, the investment that we're making in Thamesmead. Given the nature of Thamesmead, it requires a long-term commitment. Um, and, you know, that's, that's an area where there's an opportunity to create much-needed homes. And our investment, I think all I have to say is our track record in terms of it so far, given that we still are desperately um, advocating for, for a new line in the DLR, which is much needed, um, you know, to show that level of commitment, even without uh, that certainty, shows that it, it, isn't, it isn't just about land banking. I think that opportunity would have been passed over by so many players in the past. Um, and when we went into Tensmate, I think we've proved uh, our commitment through our plans, through the work. So we're not talking about the future. Our investment is now. You go in Tensmate, you see it. We are talking uh, improving our services in terms of day-to-day. -day. So when you look at our operations, say, for example, in Tensmate, you can clearly see we're the biggest, well, we're one of the, if not the biggest employer. Our presence is there. We're trying to maintain uh, Tensmate as it is now and we're trying to prepare Thamesmead for the future. So I, I think um, it's a difficult one to argue on that front, uh, particularly given the Thamesmead example. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and my other question was, um, there was a lot of feedback um, when the planning proposal went through on the Plumstead kind of Berkeley Homes project um, with you guys, um, particularly because it's not very connected to the high, well connected to the high street. You either got to go under that underpass or over that kind of three story roundabout. And I'm, I haven't looked ahead, so I'm sorry if there's been more communication about that since. But um, yeah, it'd be helpful to know like if there's ongoing discussions about how we can connect that new project up with the high street um, and the kind of yeah, resources around there better. Yeah, I won't have the exact details because we, we do have a dedicated team in region that kind of look at that detail. But as with any um, new development or, or new scheme, we're working closely with the local partners, um, you know, the local authority uh, to, to look at how a new place can fit in and have a lasting impact. So our approach to Tensmate is from a place point of view. We don't, we don't look at Tensmate as Plumstead, uh, or, or the, you know, if you like, um, you know, different parts of Tensbet. We look at Tensbet as, as a whole. Are we creating a place that can be sustainable? It, it is London's new town, as we, we like to call it. So we are looking at it from a place, and we, we do have a significant uh, experience in terms of past, and some of our leadership uh, that are leading our region plans uh, have extensive experience in town planning, uh, you know John Lewis, yeah. the team that's there, so they know how to create towns, they know how to create sustainable places. And just to add to that, as an organization as a whole, we recognize the importance of creating sustainable places, and our focus now is one of our priorities, is actually across the whole of Peabody. What can we learn from terms made in terms of creating uh, lasting places? So part of our DNA around development or setting up places we are taking a lot of learning from, you know, the opportunity we've had in terms of over the last years, and we're rolling it out across the, the whole of people. So um, there's a, a good example of our commitment on that front. Great. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any more questions? Uh, Maisie? Um, just a, a final one, but thank you very much for an incredibly detailed report. I suppose, like, what, um, in terms of your experience, what's the, the main biggest pressure you feel you have at the moment, also in the next sort of year or two, 18 months, which is, which is the kind of main pressure you feel you have in terms of provi providing residents? Um, I could say a couple or three. <laughs> um, so obviously um, the building safety remains uh, uh, a challenge, you know, how we fund that, how we make sure we protect, um, you know, uh, homeowners, um, we, the, the new regulation that I think is needed is coming. I think like with any organization, we need to make sure that any approach is proportionate. Um, so definitely those will be, but I think the biggest one is, is, is the finances. Um, I, I think given the downturn, I, I think it's clear that the, the, the current model of how we increase the supply of homes isn't working. So I think that's putting a, you know, pressures. And so if you look at building safety costs, we're talking about costs, 
operation costs or building safety costs, inflation, you know, our investment plans are almost having to do less and less because, you know, we would have planned to do more with, with, with the resources that we have, but because of a number of reasons, those resources are coming less and less. Our focus now is pivoting, uh, focusing on investing on our existing stock. Uh, we can see the challenges that we have with Denver mode, but I think it's the, the resources that will be available to housing, to Peabody and, and many other providers, local authority, um, uh, in terms of the income and being able to carry out the work and investments that's desperately needed across the board. I think that will be our biggest challenge, uh, certainly. Thank you very much, um, Wells, um, for coming today. Um, have a lovely evening. Okay, thank you. <laughs> after, after one hour of grilling, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now, um, thank you so much for your patience. We have Natalie Wilson and we also have Bernie um, from Salvin House. Thank you so much. Um, are you guys doing a presentation? You're not, so it's just questions and answers. <laughs> oh. Um, so I think how we're going to do this is we'll just let it flow. So you can just go ahead and do maybe like a informal update and I'll let the councillors ask you some questions. Yeah, I'll be perfectly honest with everyone here. Um, I've been asked to attend in place of someone um, who hasn't been able to attend. And I would probably say I'm pretty unprepared um, following Wales. Um, so my, my role within the organisation, uh, Head of Property Management, so I manage a team of property managers who are responsible for our homeowners, leaseholders uh, and freehold buildings. Um, I also work closely alongside Jackie Pauley, uh, who's the head of region, who looks after our resident services team, um, who focus in on our general needs properties within Greenwich Council. Bernie, uh, my colleague, looks after our buildings uh, for the over 55 schemes, so the independent living. Um, that's probably as much as I've got. So I think what's best yeah. to do is I take your questions. If I can answer them, of course I will. If not, we're happy to take anything away, provide any further information following this evening. Um, a, a slide day to date for you. Thank you, that sounds like a plan. Um, does anybody have any questions? We'll start with Maisie and then we'll work our way through to Councillor Adair and Councillor um, Pat. Okay, we're gonna go with Adair and then we'll go with um, Pat. Just, I mean, when we saw with Peabody that they're quite a huge organisation, can you give us some idea the size of yours, how many residents you have, and uh, any demographics you can remember? Yeah, so we have roughly 75,000 properties. Um, so um, to give a bit of background, so uh, we previously were two organisations, uh, Optvote and Southern Housing Group. Uh, we merged uh, about... 18 months ago, maybe just under. Um, so we are currently going through um, reorganisation, looking at our processes, how we're delivering our services to our customers. Um, and we are uh, quite way through that now, I think about 80% through. Um, so teams are just coming together, systems are integrating. Um, so quite a large organisation. Uh, we cover areas such as uh, London, Sussex, Kent, up to Midlands, um, and Isle of, Isle of Wight now. Um, so we're quite widespread, but um, the intention of the merger was to bring two organisations together, but to be large but local. So um, had quite dense areas of stock so that we can um, play more of a, a role in working with partners to deliver vital services to, to residents within those areas. Just a, just a quick supplementary. So roughly how many have you got in Greenwich? I've, we've got about 1,800 home ownership and leasehold properties. Uh, I haven't got the number for the general needs rented properties, I'm afraid. 
our independent living we would have in Woolwich, we've got 165 flats on the Berkeley's um, estate over here. And in Kidbrook, we have 170 for over 55. We've got one in Eltham and we've got one in Deptford. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much for coming along, and <laughs> you'll be fine. Um, I was going to ask you, because um, my sort of area is Eltham, um, so I, first of all, I was going to ask you sort of, you know, where these independent living properties were, are they sort of individual, are they in um, groups, are, are they all flats, and also, um, you know, because I'm the oldest one here, I think, I don't know, I was going to ask you, yes, about the provision for over 55s, um, are you, whether you're finding that people who are in council homes, obviously there'll be different reasons why they sort of want to come along, want the independent living. Do you find it's because they are downsizing and freeing up council homes or just a little bit more really meat on yeah. the bones about the over 55s as well? And, and, but yes, thank you. That, does that make sense? Yeah, that's fine. The property we have in Eltham is um, in McClure Co Close, which is Conniff Court. It's not actually one of my sites, but I think we've in the region of, in the 40, over 40 flats there. Um, in my sites at Woolwich and Kidbrook, I think the majority of people I, I come across coming into our schemes are downsizing because I think for the security and for probably having I mean, we're very lucky in my sites. We've got concierge services and, you know, we've got 24-hour security there. So I think it's around security. Sometimes they're not able to manage their homes anymore. Um, it may be that they've had a hospital visit and feel that they've lost a bit of confidence. So usually it's a com combination of reasons, really, that they move in. Yes. Yeah, I can do that for you. I can do that for you. And you're always welcome to come to the one at Kidbrook, yes, um, which is quite a big one. That's 170. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the one in. <laughs> yeah. And we've got the one at um, Bentham House as well in Woolwich. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, Natalie, you previously spoke about customer interaction and you spoke about looking at your processes. Now, it might be a bit of a statistical question, and I know that you don't have a presentation, but do you know, like, the threshold pertaining to your complaints? Have you done any monitoring reviews on your complaints to look at the patterns and trends just to see what the root causes are with your complaints and how you're going to go about addressing them? Yeah, so I, I would say um, one of our, our biggest things is um, keeping people informed, I think, has been a, a key trend. And I think it's fair to say that um, there, there's a large number relating to repairs and how effectively they have been managed. Um, again, we, we've introduced new processes. So, for example, for damp and mould, we now have an operating model that's followed. If we receive a report, regardless of tenure or responsibility, we will send someone to have a look inspect what, what's going on there. We offer mould washes um, because we understand the importance and we work the residents to ensure that we make some long-lasting um, improvements to make sure those issues don't arise. Um, we, we're actually currently working on a new project, so looking at the lessons from our complaints and how we really embed those lessons that we've learned um, and, and ensure that goes back into the processes. So th there's constant reviews going on um, and, and those types of things are ongoing. I haven't got the numbers on me, but as I say, I'm more than happy to provide those after this evening, uh, specifically for Greenwich, uh, and provide you with the trends uh, and, and what we're planning to do to try and improve those. Um, we, within my area, for example, um, we were running a, a patchless model, so that meant that any of our officers were able to support and help across all of our areas. Uh, we're moving away from that slightly, um, so we're looking to focus um, property managers into the areas um, specifically, so there will be dedicated people that residents are able to contact um, for support. Um, so, as I say, there, there's big changes, and I think it's fair to say it takes time to, to really embed those changes um, and, and for residents to see the benefit in those. 
Thank you so much for that. And does anybody have any questions on that side? Okay, we have David and then we have Pat. Good evening. Um, so thank you for, for coming again. Um, I just wanted to just prize the same sort of question I asked for uh, from Wales about tenancy management. I appreciate you're not on the tenancy side, mm -hmm. uh, but shared owners will also need tenancy managers to some extent, or neighbourhood managers, and just wondered what the ratio is and your retention rate, uh, particularly obviously in the areas where you are in the in, in, in the borough, um, and how what your sense of locale is. Um, and also I'm interested to know more because I know a fair bit about Peabody um, and Chart and Triangle in particular. I don't know so much about Southern because it's not in, you know, it's not where I represent or have represented. Um, so I wondered what your sort of um, holistic uh, approach and support is for your residents, not just in terms of providing a home and collecting the rent, uh, but also in terms of support on their uh, well-being, their financial challenges, uh, you know, skills, employment, and so forth. Yep. So um, in the property management side of things for homeowners, uh, I think we have roughly 9,000 homes. Um, we have uh, 13 property managers for those uh, 9,000 homes. We also have su support functions um, in, in the back office to assist with that as well. Um, we have six uh, senior property managers who manage the team. Um, and then we have two uh, heads of um, in that position. With regards to uh, the general needs side, so the rented uh, buildings, um, from memory, I think we have about 18 housing officers kind of dealing with the tenancy management side of the service. They're split into um, two areas in a patchless model. So there's the first team who will be like a triage, so dealing with kind of really quick responses that we're able to, to answer very quickly. When it's more in-depth work, uh, it's passed over to a different team who have the time allocated to be able to, to look into more detail of things to, to provide more intense support uh, in the tenancy management side of it. Similar to Wells, we also have uh, specialist teams. So we have an antisocial behaviour team. We have a social impact team uh, who focus on getting people back into work, into training, um, and, and they've, they've been very successful um, in, in that area. Uh, Bernie, for example, um, hosts things, uh, events across the borough around uh, community safety, engaging with uh, local authorities and uh, local SNTs to ensure that people feel safe and secure within their homes. Um, we have a financial inclusion team who are there to, to help support residents who are experiencing trouble with their money, um, or debts, we, we have uh, processes in place to, to offer that type of support. We do have funds in place uh, if families are experiencing hardship, where we, we can kind of help as, as best we can, putting people in touch with specialist services within the, the local boroughs. So, so there's a wide range of things that we do, and it, and it tends to be very split out into specialisms uh, within the business. Um, but as I say, the, the services will change and evolve. Um, and, and like Will says, that there's certainly a lot of pressure on housing associations to still deliver the core services and the support services, mm -hmm. but also with um, kind of withdrawing in social care, we, we have also seen um, a, an impact on the tenancy management side. Um, but we do have a tenancy sustainment team who are there to support again. So. Uh, with things such as hoarding, we, we work with residents to, to deal with the issues, put them in touch with mental health services. So we, we do have uh, a number of people working within the organisation to support tenants. Thank you, Chair. You have sort of almost answered my question. What I was going to say was, I can remember now, it was about a year ago, that, I mean, kind of court is, is, is good, it's lovely, um, but residents were getting in touch with me because they had an issue with the refuse bin collections. And I think there was an issue because, I don't know what it was, I think they're next to a Catholic um, yes. home, yes, with nuns. And they were trying to get it and this didn't through to the, the council and, and there was a lack of, somehow they weren't communicating. <coughs> so they came to me. So I'm assuming that 
that kind of thing is okay now because you're saying that you are working closely with I the council. With the team manager. Um, yes. We, she works across South East London and we support each other if she's away, I will manage her teams. And I haven't heard anything about the bins um, in the, the last couple of weeks and we have a cluster meeting weekly with all the team. So, yeah. Absolutely. Lovely. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? And on this side, it looks like it was short and sweet for you. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> but look, if anyone does have any questions and, and they want to get in touch, I'm more than happy to leave my details and, and we'll get back to you as soon as we yeah. can. Right. Thank you very much, Natalie and Bernie. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Chair, can we put in the um, minutes the list of housing providers who were asked to come tonight and if they declined their reasons for not coming? Because I made a whole list for L&Q and we haven't come tonight. But, but um, just I think it would be kind of like, just for transparency's sake, it would be um, useful for residents in parts of the borough to say that we did approach a whole list and their reasons for not coming tonight. I think that would be a good idea. Um, Izzy? Yeah, I just wanted to echo that point because I also had a lot of questions for Ellen Q, which I now um, can't ask. Uh, sorry, Ellen Q. Um, but yeah, I don't, I'd also be interested to see the data on how many times housing issues have come in the past because if there are some houses, housing associations that are regularly not turning up to this meeting, I think that should be a question that we're asking um, you know, when they're coming to us looking to do partnership projects with us. Um, this is one of the few meetings where you're kind of accountable to residents as well as backbench councillors and I think it's important that they're in attendance or if they're not coming then you know, we need to be asking questions about whether they're the right partners for us. And just again, let me just answer Izzy's question. So LNQ did come last year. So we did have a better turnout last year. I don't know why they haven't been able to come. I think it's down to timing and um, resourcing constraints, but we will get the reasons as to why they didn't come. Um, I think it was Pat and then next will be David. Only to say, uh, first of all, the director has sent his apologies. He's had a bereavement. I imagine that's in the minutes, but um, he does meet quite regularly with all of those active registered providers in the borough. And I know that he, and Wells confirmed, that he very much bigged up attendance at the scrutiny panel at the last meeting. So it is unfortunate it was a lowish turnout, so I agree with you. David? Yeah, I, I mean, I very much agree with Maisie and Izzy. I mean, in, in my ward, you know, while we've got one block, which is Peabody, it's nearly all L and Q and Moat. Um, and uh, in the borough as a whole, PA Housing are big players, um, and uh, Hyde are obviously big players as well, and they're not here. Um, I, I know there are other housing associations, um, and you know, you've got sort of five or six big ones across the borough, and I think for this special meeting, uh, we should try to aim to get them all here, really, I think. Um, so I'd be interested to know from you or, or from Raymond what response we got and what, what, what reasons were given because obviously they got many, as we found with Southern, they managed to find a substitute tonight. They have many uh, high paid officials <laughs> that, that are able, I'm sure, to uh, give up a, a couple of hours in the evening. Yeah, I'll let um, Raymond answer the more difficult questions, but we did postpone this meeting just to give them the opportunity to attend. So um, Raymond can go more into the intricacies as to why they didn't. Um, yes, uh, just as the, the chair said, we did change the date two times to give them more time to get someone to attend, but we still didn't get the attendance that we wanted. Um, but I will get back and see what the reasons are. Good. Um, from that, could we actually just make a recommendation that that the either yourself or the chair of ONS um, right to and copy in the director to say you know there's only a once a year event and rather like with the you know the transport and uh, regen scrutiny panel or transport and places it will be where they get the transport providers in they expect them to come i think we expect the big ones to come the smaller ones um you know could come every now and then but but the big ones uh they they ought to be here and i think we should make that recommendation um, and uh, write to them as well. 
uh, maybe put the date when we've got the calendar for next year uh, for the new housing and community safety panel uh, when we've got the calendar, put the date, and then we can give them advance warning. Um, I will take on that recommendation, and I will be meeting with the new chair, um, so I will be um, following on that recommendation and make sure that it's implemented. Does anybody else have anything else they would like to add? include okay um so the next item that we're going on to is the work program discussion for 2024 to 2025 and this is just a reminder for you to submit your suggestions for the hap work program um could you kindly send that to myself or send it to raymond um again i will for forward that on to the new chair um Number six is Commission on Future Reports. Um, so this is to note the report on community halls and resilience, combined housing repairs item. So we have the housing repairs update, and we have an update on transformation program, how to deal with damp and mode to invite expert witnesses. So I know that this was supposed to be done um, during my cycle, but um, it's just for us to commission these reports. Is everybody okay with them? Okay, that's fine. Um, just bear with me one moment. Yeah. Just, I mean, on um, work program, uh, commissioning of future reports, uh, Councillor Anning and I have been trying to really pursue uh, the retrofit time limited review. Um, it's been quite hard. Uh, Council Anning in particular has done an awful lot of research, but it's been quite hard, and I think a bit more impetus would be useful. Um, so we're trying to arrange a visit to Luton, um, which we've been in contact with the leader there, and to um, obviously locally as well, but, but it's putting together the research, doing the, the, um, the outline, um, you know, uh, as is, and policy position and so forth, to... And, I just think it needs a bit more oomph. I mean, I think we've done what we can uh, to date, um, but, but it is a really pressing issue. Um, and, you know, 2030 is, is ticking away, <laughs> getting nearer. Um, so uh, we're not going to be able to complete it in this municipal year. So we'll have to follow through and be completed in the uh, next uh, municipal year on, in, on the new housing and... Um, uh, community safety panel. Yeah. Just to add on that, Chair, um, it would be very helpful if um, uh, before the, the new round of committees starts that David and I do receive some recommendations for viewing um, best and possibly worst uh, examples in uh, the Greenwich Borough. We've asked for this several times and we want uh, some examples so th and we would hope that all of the committee would accompany us on uh, uh, the site visits for one example of the, 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 the best retrofitting and one example um, of uh, the worst or, or what might be needed there. Now, we have asked for these um, uh, suggestions uh, several times. It's not something that we can provide it must come from officers, and that would be very useful to get as soon as possible so that we can at least start planning. Thank you. Okay, um, I've noted what you've both said. Um, I will chase the retrofitting for you. Um, do you think it would be helpful if you also got some experts involved in this particular report that you're trying to do? Yeah? Okay, and would it also be helpful for you to have like a meeting with myself and also with Leo Fletcher, the new chair, just obviously that he's aware of what he's embarking on? Okay, that's fine. Thank you so much. So yeah, just to reiterate, please do send your new recommendations over. Um, and thank you all. You've been wonderful and really collaborative as well. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. <laughs>